The same power that raised Jesus up from the grave, the same spirit I cannot contain. glad that you guys could be here to see part of what we did this week. We had an, a great week. Did you guys have a good week this week? I'm not very convinced. Did you guys have a good week? No. Yes, it was so exciting. Um, but we're going to ask you to stand with us. Some of these next songs are actually some old hymn renditions. You might know the words. You probably won't know the actions, but we would encourage you to do them along with us as well. So why don't you go ahead and stand on up and we'll, you can sing those with us. <laughs> is there is power, power in the blood. Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. Would you do service for Jesus? Your 
king. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. But you live daily, his praises to sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. This last song we're going to sing, you probably all recognize. It's All Creatures Ever God and King, but the kids worked hard this week, and we learned sign language. So we're going to go ahead and sing that with you, but we're going to do some sign language along with it.
Good morning to, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning to everyone. We're glad to see so many people here on VBS Sunday. Uh, at this time, we will go to our time of communion and prayer. Uh, for any of our guests and visitors, if there is some here at Madison here, the pew in front of you on the back, there is some emblems. And uh, we take that at this time. So if you wish to partake, uh, please feel free to. Uh, at this time, uh, will you please bow with me as we go to a word of prayer for our communion. Lord, we love you. Prepare our hearts and minds in the next few minutes as we partake of the cup and the loaf. Will you realize the sacrifice that you made for us all? You gave your life so that we would have a place in heaven with, in eternity with you. Please bless these emblems, the cup, the loaf, the emblems that are the sign of your broken and beaten body on the cross. Also bless each person and who partakes from this day forward. We ask this all in your son's Jesus name. Amen. Come to the time in our service for offering. Uh, we still, we're not passing trays around. Uh, if you wish, there's an offering plate at the back of the sanctuary and one in the lobby on your way out. Uh, but let's go to God in prayer for our offerings. Dearly Father, you've given us so much, everything. You've given us life itself, 
beautiful, wonderful world we live in. Most importantly, God, you have given us salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. What he did for us on the cross and over the grave. Dear God, we cannot repay those. But in your kingdom, God, you ask us to be generous, to give and share with one another. So we bring these gifts to your church and ask that you bless them to your kingdom. That through the church, the gospel will reach the corners of the earth. I pray this in your name. Amen. You'll have to take my word for it. It was even more fun than it looked like in there. Last week, we ended our time together. Sorry? Oh, uh, 82 different kids were here for VBS. So, 82. Yeah? Quite a few. Quite a few. And so we had a great time. Let's never do it outside again, though. Uh, last week, uh, we ended our time here together with a passage that exhorted all of us to serve one another within the church. That was, that was the gist of it. Uh, in Romans 12, 6 or 7, we read these verses where it said, If your gift is prophesying, then, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. The message was, if there's something for you to do, and you can do it in, in God's family, in God's church, then, then get to work. 
And this week at VBS, when we had 82 different kids out here, uh, I got to see so many of you put that into action. And I just want to say thank you. So many Mattis nights were teaching lessons, helping with crafts, making snacks, worshiping with kids. We had uh, people going around here cleaning every surface uh, like 20 times throughout the morning uh, to help us be safe, like our own living Roomba. And it was just awesome. There, wa there was a tent crew, and there were many who gave rides to VBS students, and uh, there are many who, who gave uh, so that we could host VBS, uh, do certain things with hand sanitizer and all the cleaning products we used this week, and, and I just want to say thanks. Uh, every task that was done here in the name of the Lord, however menial, in fact, especially the menial ones that nobody saw, uh, rise up as an offering to God. And importantly, uh, if what we believe about God's Word is true, and if there's anything real about church, and if Jesus of Nazareth really did rise from the tomb, then teaching kids about God is the most important thing we can do. And I want to thank everyone who's a part of that at Madison Church. You guys always do awesome with VBS and things like this, and this week was no exception. So thank you. We're going to pick up this week right where we left off there in Romans 12. Uh, we're starting in verse 9, and uh, I want you to know that it has not escaped my attention. It has not escaped my attention that I, I personally uh, have spent a lot of time and words berating the adult Sunday school class at Madison Church for taking a decade-long pace through the book of Romans. And I like to give them a hard time about that. And, but we're currently moving through this chapter at such a pace that would require 186 weeks to complete the book of Romans. Okay, so uh, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm just as bad as you, Randy, wherever you are, if you're listening to this. And uh, today the bad news is that we're, we're not in any position to speed up. <laughs> so um, these words are, are, are special in the Bible, not because they're any more important or any more inspired than, than other, other passages that we read in the Bible that we go through faster. But the Bible, uh, even though all of it's God-breathed and, and I find every page of it fascinating, sometimes it's hard to connect what you're reading there with the rest of your day. You know, sometimes it can be hard to understand how Jephthah relates to what you're going to do this afternoon when your family gets together. It, it can be hard to understand how this, these words that you're reading the Bible intersect with your life. Well, that's not true in Romans chapter 12. That's not true in the passage we're going through where it is very easy to see that God's Word is telling us directly how we're supposed to live in response to the gospel. Here in this chapter, we're told that, that we cannot go on living the way that the world does, that there has to be a new way of life in Jesus Christ and a new culture. Uh, culture is the, is the mode of life that we construct together. It is the way of living that we agree to participate in with each other. We're told very early in the book of Romans that, that the way the world lives, the world's culture, is darkened by sin. And that we can't just play along. It's not an option for uh, people who have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have a new culture, a new way of life, which is transformed by the renewing of our mind. And it all starts there, then this way of life. Then it touches our family, and then our church family. And this, this is how it proceeds. This is the way the war on culture is waged from our minds to our families and in our church. Not, not by marching on Washington or Des Moines. That's not how a culture war is waged, but by humbly serving one another, first in the church, that is how we'll conquer the world. Now, God's Word is going to start, as we go on here in this chapter, shooting instructions at us, rapid fire. And these are brief, uh, very short instructions, uh, but they are also incredibly challenging, just because they're short and, and each of them comprise only a, a handful of words. It uh, doesn't mean that they're easy to do or easy to accept. We'll take them one by one this morning, starting in verse 9, with these words, love must be sincere. 
This is what follows this instruction to serve one another humbly in the church and, and to get to work is this instruction, love must be sincere. I think this is serving as a heading here for what we're going to read, which follows after verse 9. Uh, it's not grammatically different than any of the other instructions that we'll read, of which there are a bunch. I think like 13 in a row here. Um, but uh, because it's first in the list, I think this is kind of an introduction or a heading for what we're about to read. It says, love must be sincere. This word for sincerity means not acted, uh, not, not as an actor would be, or, or not with a mask. Okay, there's a Greek word, hypocritos. Uh, it's where we get our English word hypocrite. Okay? But in, in Greek, it, it describes an actor or, or somebody who's performing in a play. Right? It, it literally means to wear a mask. And this word here for sincerity just takes that word and puts a negating alpha in front of it. So the opposite of to wear a mask and to act. Love must be something that we are. The love that we share with each other can't be uh, something that, that we do for a while or pretend or something that we do for, for other reasons, but the love that we share is something that we need to possess, inhabit, live within. On this passage, uh, commentator Jack Cottrell uh, from Cincinnati, he writes this. He says, this is, the this is the essence of the love enjoined upon us as Christians. It differs from the other forms of love in that this love does not depend on some uncontrollable or inner emotion or desire or need for fulfillment within the one who loves, but rather is a deliberately willed attitude of concern and goodwill based on the needs of the one who is loved. So there's, there's a certain kind of love that, that happens in our world that is dependent on how the thing you're loving makes you feel. It's the kind of love you have for sports teams. It's the kind of love that, uh, that, that sometimes it, if, you, if you bring that kind of love to a relationship like a marriage, then you're probably going to encounter trouble. It's going to put you in danger. It's the kind of love that, that measures how the object of your love helps you. It's not always going to help. Uh, my love for the Cubs does not always help me. It does not always make me feel good when our closer gets, gives up like four home runs in six games. It's not, it doesn't make me feel good. But our love, the one that we offer to each other, the one we have to be sincere about, is not, is not an evaluation of how we make each other feel. The love that we share together in Christ's family in this new way of life is just a promise, a promise to value their concerns and their needs, a promise to lift them up, even and especially when they don't deserve it. Then we get uh, these important words next. In, at the end of verse 9, it says, Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. When we apply this to love, it, it may seem strange, you see, because love in the Bible, the love that, we're in, that is enjoined upon us here in Romans 12, is not like the love that the world teaches us to have. Our world is teaching us about love that is a, a kind of love that is different than the one we're told about in God's Word. The love in our world is shapeless. It is an emotion which applies to all things. But love in God's world, in God's word, has a form. It has edges. It has a shape. Love is not universal acceptance. It is not, uh, it is not accepting each and every choice as good. Rather, love in God's word has a shape. I want to show you a passage in, in Philippians 1 that says some, some strange things that don't seem to belong with love the way that we think of it today. It says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Those don't sound like things that we're used to discussing with love in the year 2020. Your knowledge may abound, that your love may abound in knowledge and depth of insight. Those are things that we do with our head. Those are analytical processes that it could only be true of a love that has a certain shape, of a love which 
that possesses a form which we must perceive and enact. It goes on to say, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Not, or, sorry, filled with the love of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness, being right with God that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see, love in God's Word, in this new way of life, in the, in the culture that, that results from having Jesus Christ as your Savior, has a certain shape. It has boundaries, boundaries set by what is righteous and what is evil. And we're not just told to, to love one another as in to accept everybody's choice and to accept every way of life, but we are told to love in a way that hates what is evil and clings to what is good. I want to show you some words from the Bible that you have definitely heard before if you have ever been to a wedding. Okay? If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Those words are from 1 Corinthians 13. Sometimes we'll call it the love chapter. That's why it appears in every, almost every wedding. I think in every wedding I've ever done, these words appear. Now, what I want to point out to you here this morning is that these words don't appear in the Bible in a manual for wedding services. That's not why they're there. These words don't appear in, in Scripture uh, so that people can get married over them. These words in the Bible appear in a, after, after a list of spiritual gifts by which the Christian brothers and sisters are supposed to serve one another. These words aren't given to husbands and wives, though husbands and wives need to live out this kind of love. But that's not what they're there for. <laughs> These words are given to brothers and sisters in the church as a means for how they are to serve one another. In fact, Paul says the most excellent way of service to one another is this kind of love. And I want you to notice the, the words I've underlined there is that this kind of love has a certain shape. It has a certain kind of limit. We are trained by our world, cudgeled even, to accept a kind of love which accepts all choices and accepts all decisions and uh, behaviors and lifestyles. But that is not the kind of love enjoined upon us by God's Word. That's not the kind of love that belongs in the new kind of life that we are given in Jesus Christ, in this new culture, this culture that is different than the world's. Love does not embrace evil or untruth. That is what makes our culture in Jesus Christ, our new way of life, stand out from the way that our world lives, from the darkness in our evil world. We recognize within the church, within those who have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we recognize that, that certain behaviors and lifestyles are contrary to the truth of God's Word and are ultimately harmful to our family and to our friends and to the people uh, in our society. And thus, we, we don't embrace those things. To regard them with love doesn't mean to, to accept them and to encourage them, but to regard them with love means to point out that they are acting in error, that they are practicing untruth, that they have untethered themselves from the uh, way that God has made them to live. So we don't endorse or the untruth that they want to live. Our love pursues righteousness for each other. To love someone in the Christian faith, to love somebody in this new culture, means to wish for them that they would be in right standing before God. Not a love that will allow them to remain in their own sin and destruction. That is not love. And this is a most crucial distinction for our time. 
because this is not the way the world teaches us to love. Our world right now, at the movie theater, or on the television screen, or the, the magazine you pick up at the dentist's office, is overtly, unashamedly, trying to pressure you to accept a form of love that is different than the one presented in God's Word. And when they ask you to show love or to let love win, they mean something other than what God's Word means by the act of love and by asking us to love each other sincerely and be devoted to one another in love as we have here in Romans 12, 9 and 10. They ask us to practice a love that welcomes all lifestyles and choices as valid, as relative to the goodness determined in the mind of the chooser. And this pressure will only increase. Our world is on a trajectory for this pressure to become stronger. I believe that a day is on the horizon where we're practicing a biblical kind of love that hates what is evil and clings to what is good will threaten to take your job or your business. Where a biblical understanding of humanity and people will carry financial penalties. Maybe more. When that day arrives, I'll thank God for the opportunity that we'll have to suffer for his name. See, the way that our world wants us to love is only possible if the words in this book aren't true. A kind of love that, it, that accepts everything as good and accepts each person's choice as what is right for them is, is only possible if there isn't something true for everyone all at the same time. But there is. There is a way of life that our God the God who made each and every person, the God who made this world, and the God who will return again to claim it for his own, wants us to live. It's only true, their kind of love, the world's kind of love, is only true if, if these words are false, or if what this book says about who Jesus of Nazareth was isn't real. But you see, we live in a world who has already accepted that premise. We live in a world who has already passed the point of, of wondering whether or not these words are true. Of wondering whether or not the Jesus that we meet here in, this page, in these pages was really God's Son and Savior. We live in a world who, is, who has considered those questions and answered them with no. That is why they love the way that they do. That is why their way of life is the way that it is. That is why we cannot conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. If you believe that God's word is true, and that the Jesus of Nazareth that we read about in these pages really is who he says he is in here, then we have to reject the way that the world teaches us to love. We have to practice a love that has a shape, a form. The world will keep pushing us to love like they do. But listen. If you're a believer, then listen. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. That is how you are to love. For the redeemed of Jesus Christ, there's just no other way. Now, we're going to cover four verses today. Four verses with ten commands. We've gotten one verse down and we have eight commands left. <laughs> Let's do the next eight a little quicker. Okay, in verse 10 here in Romans 12, it says, Be devoted to one another in love. Here, I want, to, I want you to see that, that that instruction that we got there about hate what is evil, cling to is good cling to what is good, is sandwiched between two teachings about love. Uh, it's a characterization of what love looks like. And we read, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor 
serving the Lord. It means that we're, we're not to grow tired or grow weary. We're not to give up living this new life, but we are to keep at it. Keep at it, not, not in a begrudging way that folds one's arms, and, but to be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Patient in affliction is, is an interesting phrase here because oftentimes when we think of patient in affliction or pa- being patient in affliction, it, uh, it's easier to, th- to be patient in affliction for natural causes, right? Things that we might otherwise blame God for, a hailstorm or, uh, or a sickness or, or something like that, to be patient in affliction. But as we'll see as we read on in Romans chapter 12, as we get to the next um, few verses in the coming weeks, we'll see that, that what, what is probably meant by affliction here is when we're mistreated by other people, when other people do us wrong. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. This is an important one. To be faithful in prayer. Now, being faithful to God is something the Bible talks to us about. It means that never giving up or never giving up on, on loving God and on worshiping Him. Okay? So being faithful in prayer means never giving up on prayer. Okay? So among each other, as we're being devoted to one another in love, being faithful to prayer means always lifting up one another in prayer and, and never skipping it, say, you know, in your worship service, where we normally start out with a prayer for the people that we have in our bulletin on the list. But we had uh, VBS kids singing songs this morning. We didn't do that. So let's not violate the passage that we're reading, and let's pray to God for each other. This is what it means to be faithful in prayer. We have people listed in our bulletin each week who you can spend time praying for, people in our church family, related to our church family, who have needs, who uh, would like us to intercede before God on their behalf. So as you see there, as you see that list, there are more we need to pray for. Uh, th- this week, there, there are people we can add to our list. Marvin broke a bone in his foot, and he's sec- his second week on crutches. He told me this morning, Mar- this is Marvin Keller, he told me this morning his wife did it. I'm not so sure about that. There are, uh, in our church, we have uh, Chase and Kayla Foss. They just recently had twin baby girls. They showed up too early, <laughs> and they're tiny. They're going to be in the hospital for, for a while. Now, they're doing good, and they're healthy, and the, the babies are doing all the things that the doctors want them to do, but they, they came out weighing three pounds, and so they're going to be in there for a while, and it, it just happens to be a certain a time in our world where having uh, infants in the hospital all the time is harder than usual. They can't, they can't stay there overnight. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure the, the, their, grand, their parents, uh, the baby's grandparents, are, are not allowed to go in and see them. <laughs> and uh, so it's just a very difficult time. And so we can lift up the, those two baby girls, Rosemary and Isabella are their names, and Chase and Kayla. Also this morning I was made aware of a, a, a prayer need for, for Darren, Chet, Darren Chitwood and his wife Ashley. That's Brian's son. And uh, they're expecting a child and, and they're just having some complications with the pregnancy. We just want to lift them up. So let's be faithful in prayer and lift up the needs of our church family here together this morning. Dear God, I come to you this morning in prayer for our church family. In prayer for the brothers and sisters in Christ you've so graciously given us. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, there, are, there are needs here on this list, and the people we've mentioned, needs for healing and strength and encouragement. Dear God, in addition to, to what you've already heard us speak about, I'm thinking of our, uh, the nursing home residents in our congregation who um, have just been uh, shut in their building for so long. And dear God, I just pray that you will give them a kind of joy and resolve and peace that that can only come through having your spirit. Dear God, I pray that you will help them feel our fellowship. And you'll help them feel, even though we can't see them, 
I pray that you will help them feel the love that we feel for them. Dear God, we pray for those baby girls in Des Moines, for Isabella and for Rosemary. I ask that you will help them grow. Help them grow to be healthy. Pray for Chase and Kayla. That you will give them encouragement and energy. Heavenly Father, we just lift up Darren and his wife Ashley to you. We ask that you will protect their child. We ask that you will give them peace. Heavenly Father, we lift up each other in prayer because it is the act of love which you have enjoined upon us. Help us to be faithful to this practice. Help us to be faithful to lifting one another up to your throne in prayer. Praise in your name. Amen. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and then share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. The practice hospitality one is a, is a fun one. The word in Greek for hospitality literally means to love a stranger. Practice hospitality, to love a stranger. We have covered just four verses today. We have read ten instructions. And it can be hard. Maybe you won't have an opportunity in each and every day to do all ten of these things. Though you certainly would have an opportunity each day to be faithful, patient, joyful, devoted to one another, to show honor. But these are not a punch list. It's not a, it's not a checklist for you to, to mark off so that you can consider your day in Christ's new way of life or new culture complete. These instructions form a direction or a trajectory on which we are to live our lives that is away from the darkness and untruth of our world. They're all a description of one singular direction. This is to be our, our culture our way of life. These are our bedrock compulsions for God's people. This is how living this way in the kind of life that can be described by the 10 instructions we've read here in Romans 12, 9 through 13, is, is the way for us to embrace or to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is the way that we reject the way of the world, and transform our minds according to God's will. Each time we do these things and practice this new kind of life, this different kind of life, it is a brick paving the way for us to walk in obedience to God. So when you read them, you have to examine your heart, not just your heart, but your calendar and your planner and the steps you are taking each moment of the day to ask yourself if you are living the way that the world is teaching you, the way of darkness, the way of untruth, or if you're living the new kind of life that we are given in Christ's kingdom, the new kind of life that practices sincere, true love. Will you be conformed to the way of the world today when you leave this building? Or will you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Will your life be the old one, the one that everybody else lives, in darkness, the way of sin? Or will your life look like the one we're told to live in God's word here in Romans 12? If we take up this task together, if this is something that we share, if this is something that we do among each other in this body, in this church, then we will conquer the world. That's what God's Word says. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, transform our lives. As I read these words, I, I'm convicted that my life does not always look like these ten descriptions. Dear 
So God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive us of our sins. Transform our minds so that we will embrace the new way of life that we have through your spirit and in your kingdom. Help us to love one another sincerely in a way that hates evil and clings to good so that your wonderful gospel, the brilliant light you have unleashed upon this world, will be unveiled. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close today?